Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Drobo Broadcast Network. My name is Mario Blandini at Drobo, and today we're talking about high availability and the fact that it doesn't have to be very complicated or expensive for SMBs through server virtualization. And uh, joining us to talk about this topic today is our special guest, Michael Lewither, who is a senior product manager with Microsoft. How are you doing today, Michael? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Matt. All right. So Hyper-V is what we're talking about because it is server virtualization. You don't have to have it be complicated if you're a small and medium business. And our audience uh, typically is of a smaller organization, but they have the same type of applications uh, that large organizations do. And they've already started consolidating and virtualizing servers. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the latest approaches and architectures to server virtualization from a small and medium business point of view. So maybe you can give us a little bit of background on yourselves. I believe you're part of the Hyper-V group, but I detect a little bit of a non-specific international accent. So uh, uh, how is it that you came to work at Microsoft? You give us a little information there. Sure, sure. So yes, I do have the, uh, the odd Australian accent. Um, I, worked, I came out through Microsoft in Australia uh, basically as a consultant um, working on exchange deployment. And really early on, Microsoft realized uh, when we deployed Active Directory that, um, or when we released Active Directory, that um, the only people that really knew our directories were the Exchange guys. So um, I uh, became a Windows 8 Active Directory um, consultant overnight. And, uh, and then when virtualization really started kicking off around 2006, 2007, I really moved over to the States and, and uh, have been on the Hyper-V team ever since. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think uh, Microsoft doesn't necessarily need an introduction. Most folks know uh, who Microsoft is, uh, the largest software company on the planet, and been around uh, almost as long as uh, I have. So <laughs> uh, a, a long-standing uh, company there for sure. Let's uh, go right into the content and talk about why a small and medium business virtualizes. You wouldn't think a small business has very many servers, but you might agree that for a IT deployment, you're going to have a small handful of Microsoft servers in a business, if they're running a DNS, you know, file and print, Exchange, SQL, those sort of things. So there is a benefit to do consolidation, and hardware cost, I think, is the number one thing there. Uh, is that what you're also seeing being the number one driver amongst smaller organizations? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think that um, you know, many organizations are either getting off aging hardware or want to consolidate their physical hardware to, to um, you know, multi-proc platforms, and, and virtualization is the key for that. Great. Well, um, all right. I think as a former IT person myself, one of the reasons I like consolidating is that you can test things a little bit more easily once you virtualize. We used to have, uh, back in the day, downtime over the weekends, which doesn't exist anymore. So when do you do a lot of this work? Uh, you really can't unless you have the ability to test it. Now, more than testing, though, I think high availability is one of those requirements that folks desire, but maybe they don't think they can get it. Do you see most Hyper-V users in smaller organizations taking advantage of the live migration and high availability capabilities that are built into the product? Yeah, we see that in, in medium business and upper medium business, and especially in the Windows Server 2008 R2 uh, application because our live migration relies on clustering for that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and we've tried to make clustering as easy out of the box for definitely the, the medium business organize, organization. Well, it, it's gotten a lot easier, the whole cluster validation built right in, which uh, is helping a lot of folks. I personally have used it and found it pretty easy to use. Uh, having clustering was at one time considered really complicated, and we don't want to foreshadow anything coming in uh, Windows Server 2012 that will make it even easier. But even as it exists today for a smaller organization, if they deploy Hyper-V, they can get the benefits of doing host maintenance. Once you have the clustering set up, you can migrate applications to different hardware so you can do hardware maintenance. This is, allows you to work during the day, I think, which a lot of people would prefer to do versus work over the odd weekend once a month. So another question around uh, mobility. Maybe you can talk about the idea of moving and whether a quick migration versus a live migration. At a high level, what would the differences be between those two approaches? Yeah, sure, sure. So a quick migration in Hyper-V is movement with downtime. So effectively, you know, uh, if you're moving from one node from a cluster to another, it actually uh, moves via a snapshot type mechanism. So it will take the, the VM offline for, you know, a, a matter of seconds or, or multiple numbers of seconds. Not a huge amount of time, but, but your, you know, applications and, and users will experience downtime. 
for a live migration, which we introduced in the uh, 2008 R2 timeframe, uh, moves from one node to another without any downtime. Mm-hmm. So you have um, no uh, no end user experience and no application downtime. There's a tiny small brownout as uh, the the NIC addresses are rewrite rewritten, but it's in a millisecond uh, type of timeframe. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to have you uh, on our program today, Michael, is because a lot of uh, customers who have d- deployed storage in a Microsoft server environment are using either internal RAID or maybe have a direct attached storage device. And to take full advantage of mobility and um, moving applications between different uh, Hyper-V host servers, you do need to have a shared storage solution. It allows you to consolidate your storage, but also gives you that HA for virtual servers. And we'll talk a lot more about that architecture here as the topic of today's discussion. In terms of shared storage, uh, as the diagram shows everyone here, it allows folks to have access to the same storage regardless of what host you're on. Because the storage is connected to all nodes, the cluster manages access to the disks. And uh, in this case, whether you're doing it without Hyper-V or with Hyper-V, you mentioned uh, Michael, that there is a requirement on clustering here. Can you talk a, at a high level about how the clustering works and ensures uh, the coordination amongst all of the nodes? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, for I mean, clustering itself is is multiple nodes, multiple servers utilizing shared storage, and uh, basically we have a number of different ways that we can uh, approach uh, uh, clustering uh, in a way, but. For Hyper-V, it's uh, what we call active-passive, which means that um, our, the node will own the Hyper-V virtual machine at that stage, um, and then a planned failover or an unplanned failover, they'll move from one node to another um, and be active, uh, be actively owned by that second node. Um, mm-hmm. But, the, but the, the main thing here is that these clusters do require shared storage. All the nodes of the cluster um, have access to shared storage, and, 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 and fairly performance shared storage as well, because you just don't want that to be your bottleneck in a cluster. Mm-hmm. and have access to um, you know, multiple nodes as well. All right, we uh, talked about server high availability and resiliency. With clustering, uh, whether it's the classic way or with Hyper-V, you do have uh, some ability to do automated failover in the event of having an outage. Is that any different to set up if you're using Hyper-V versus traditional clustering? No, no, it's exactly the same. You know, whether you're using a Hyper-V or an SMB file server role or, or DHCP on a cluster, um, you know, auto failover and, and affinity are um, uh, exactly the same across all those roles. Well, I think live migration is the, the requirement a lot of folks are looking for, mostly because, uh, and I'm not sure if you'd agree, Michael, but our studies show that the most common failover operation isn't because of a meteor strike or a flood. While those things do happen, it's usually because you, you want to trigger it yourself, either to do a migration to get off of older equipment or to do maintenance or to rebalance some of the applications between some of your hosts. Do you find that the advantage of being able to do live migration really gives you more benefits on the maintenance side than it does, at least you use it more often, I should say, on the maintenance side than you would to truly recover from a disaster? Oh, exactly. Plan migrations are definitely one of the, the premier uh, things that people use clustering for. You know, you, you mentioned before being able to do patching, uh, both hardware patching and software patching. I mean, you want to be able to do that without having to affect any of the guests on your cluster. Um, so you can easily migrate them to another node while you patch that physical server and patch the OS on that server and then move the nodes back. And then um, balance redistribution, whether that's you know, manually through the cluster manager or whether you can automate that through some tools such as Virtual Machine Manager. You know, they're definitely two big priorities. And live migration is the key behind those, the ability to move your virtual machines around without zero, you know, with zero downtime um, is a value to every customer. We know that a lot of smaller organizations uh, have traditionally been a little bit roadblocked from doing a lot of this. Either they thought clustering was too complicated or things like shared storage were too costly for them to take an endeavor of because some technologies like Fiber Channel can be very expensive. But iSCSI SAN is a technology that can fit the needs of a smaller organization from a uh, cost perspective. Also, it's less complex, and in the case of Drobo, the, we uh, do offer some really easy-to-use storage that fits really well into this sort of architecture. So going into a little bit further, the basic architecture, what you need, odds are a lot of the things that you would need to put a highly available solution for your applications are already in place. Things like a network, things like uh, the servers that you actually already have. 
Michael, do you see a lot of folks who have uh, some standalone Windows servers today loading Hyper-V over the top of those, or do they typically go to Hyper-V by buying new server hardware? How do you normally see smaller organizations going about that deployment? Um, in the first stages, we see them deploying Hyper-V on existing hardware, especially if their hardware is only uh, a few years old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely a common practice. But you know, as you move into more, uh, you know, as you start seeing more value, you get more cost recovery from a consolidation point of view. You know, investing in, in new hardware and then um, greater solutions such as iSCSI and, and you know, centralized storage and HA becomes definitely within the reach of many SMB organizations. Right, and so. That makes sense that you don't have to buy everything brand new in order to do a deployment like this. A lot of the people think that they do, which you may not need to. Another thing from a network perspective, and this is where there's a lot of argument uh, for sure, Michael, around do you use the same network that you're using for everything else? Can you get away with just using VLANs within that same network to create uh, an isolated network for your storage? Or do you have to go out and buy all new switches uh, in order to do your shared network? Uh, there's pros and cons to both approaches, and certainly you can use the same old network. What are you seeing amongst people doing it for the first time? Are they taking the plunge into dedicated switches, or do they uh, make use of the existing network they already have? You know, it's a great question, and, and as you say, there's pros and cons to both. And I think I think many organisations, when they first move into iSCSI-based storage, they use their existing infrastructure until they understand what their bandwidth requirements are. What you know, both from a, a storage point of view and from an application point of view. And this is where really, you know, partners can be a great help in the sense in understanding that as well. But the recommendation is to use a, a dedicated uh, network for your iSCSI solutions. However, that doesn't preclude you from using your existing infrastructure. You've just got to be aware of balancing your uh, bandwidth and your quality of service. Right. I think a lot of folks do have networking infrastructure that's capable of VLAN. So if you don't go and get fully isolated hardware, certainly you can do a good job of logically isolating things on your network using uh, the facilities that are available to you there. And in the case of Drobo Storage, it's gigabit Ethernet storage. If you have a switch that's capable of switching without any oversubscription or congestion, you uh, have little to worry about with regard to performance there. You do need shared storage, though, if you want to take advantage of the high availability features. And the virtualization software has to support this as well. You might imagine that we have lots of users that uh, are using other virtualization platforms, and there, there are free versions for sure, but that high availability and fa failure isn't something you get for free with other virtualization hypervisors out there. Just so uh, folks are clear, in the case of Hyper-V, you uh, have it available uh, as a part of the base offering. There's no need to buy additional licenses in order to get this live migration or HA feature, are there? That's right, yes. All in the box. So that's cool. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why we have uh, quite a few people attending live on today's session. Thanks, folks, for joining in today's session. Let's talk about requirements, though, and we'll go through this really quick. I think most small and medium businesses, if they rank things in order, cost effect is probably number one. Uh, from a storage perspective, most small organizations don't have a storage guy or a person that's dedicated just to that function. So they need things to integrate rather easily and just work without having to have a lot of expertise. Certainly, there's features within the hypervisor that it makes sense to leverage. And naturally, you talked about performance being uh, in there. It's got to work. If it doesn't uh, give you reasonable performance, certainly it's not going to be there. But in terms of choosing the right hypervisor, we talked a little bit about cost effective. Uh, in terms of the, the way that's supported, what type of cost or fees would be associated with uh, standardizing on a uh, Hyper-V environment for a small organization? Well, effectively, it's the cost of the operating system. You know, Hyper-V is a standard offer, a standard offer in, our, um, in our major editions of Windows Server, standard all the way through data center. Mm -hmm. And so is clustering and all the solutions as well. So from that perspective, uh, from an operating system cost, the, the purchase of the OS, and then the infrastructure that goes along with it. So for, for a um, you know, entry-level solution for a small and medium business, uh, it's a, a phenomenal and affordable solution. Well, one of the reasons why I like the solution is that the management concepts are going to be familiar because, as you mentioned, it's built into the, the Microsoft management framework. So there's no additional learning curve. Do you find that most folks who never used Hyper-B before find it fairly easy to jump right in and start using it? Or are there certain things they need to go through in order to get prepared just to, in order to have enough knowledge to manage it? No, it's exactly why, the way we designed it. You know, we wanted to design that. You had some familiarity with 
for Windows Server administration, you can jump straight into Hyper-V management. The console is, is very simple to use. The aspects of joining to storage and joining the network, again, are very simplified, and you have all those at your fingertips. And then for the more advanced users, you can uh, go well and deep, and we can use all our PowerShell commands if you wanted to, uh, to, to completely script it. So uh, we basically provide a solution for, for any range of IT skill. Well, while we're talking about management, Maybe you can give us uh, your view on this, Michael, with regard to how deeply people go into virtualization. Is it that they uh, maybe jump in to the, the shallow end and half the body is underwater, half the body's over their kind of mixed physical server and virtual server? Maybe they don't virtualize everything uh, straight away. Or do you see more people doing a test deployment, becoming comfortable with it, and then jumping both feet into the deep end and doing 100% uh, virtualized, going from you know, zero to 100% very quickly. Uh, how do most organizations that you've worked with on the smaller side uh, typically evolve with regard to how fast they do the adoption and how long they keep a mixture of physical and virtual together? Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, I see a mixture of both, I, but I see a lot more aggressive uptake of virtualization in, in small and medium businesses. Uh, one, because there's a lot less complexity um, in, uh, in deployment. You know, the, the big thing about virtualization, the, your, your number one, thought about it is, what are you virtualizing and can it support a virtualization infrastructure? Um, you know, from a database and infrastructure point of view, it's a no-brainer. I can put SQL, I can put my Active Directory, I can put my DNS service, the HTTP service on a virtualized infrastructure and get massive consolidation savings based on that. But then I have to think about my line of business application. You know, can my line of business application be supported under a virtualized infrastructure? And if it can, how do I want to deploy that? So we definitely see a lot of aggressive uptake of Hyper-V, but the way I think about it is, you know, I think virtualization is, is a life cycle in a way, in the sense that, you know, our first life cycle, which is sort of the basic approach, is the concept of consolidating service. Which workloads do you want to consolidate? Let's start consolidating our hardware, start utilizing shared storage, start you know, taking advantage of the inbuilt um, high availability. And once I've done that, then I can actually start looking at standardizing my IT operations to save further money, and then maybe orchestrating or even automating some of that as well, again, to save more and more IT costs. Since I have a virtualization infrastructure, I have a massive amount of flexibility in the way that I manage and deploy and customize my system. Well, I agree, and if you build the infrastructure correctly the first time, which is the t subject of this webcast, you can enjoy a lot of those benefits, continue to scale and evolve from a, a basic uh, sort of configuration to one that's much more advanced. And uh, the great thing about it is you can reap benefits in every step along the way. There's no need to go to all the way to the fourth stage in order to finally get to your ROI. You can get ROI in the very first stage of doing your basic consolidation and uh, having your high availability. I have a question here talking about System Center Virtual Machine Manager, Michael, and whether or not that's a requirement for doing live migrations or various HA options. Do you have to have a uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager in order to do those, or can you still have live migration in HA without that product also installed? So you do not need Virtual Machine Manager for live migration nor for um, high availability in a clustering. Your Virtual Machine Manager definitely um, helps that you know, in a multi-virtual machine, multi-site organization. The virtual machine manager allows me to, you know, sort of amalgamate or consolidate my view across my entire organization of virtual machines. And so I have that, that one, you know, if I have, say if I have five or ten virtual machine hosts, um, a virtual machine manager will consolidate them in a single view and I'll be able to manage them, I'll be able to deploy templates. So it just eases my administration. Plus it also allows me for things like capacity planning and automated planning, so if I have if one host is, is loading up too much, it will automatically move virtual machines around in, in, the, in the infrastructure. So it definitely allows me, when we talked about that step approach, it sort of allows me to start orchestrating and automating my organization a lot more. Instead of being reactive, my IT moves more into proactive uh, proactivity. But as I said, everything is out of the box. You don't need virtual machine manager in your first step. All right. So a small organization can uh, get started there. It's a good thing when you find that you've evolved to the point where you might need more of that orchestration and, and hopefully you've saved yourself enough time by the, all the savings from going to shared SAN and going to uh, virtualization that you have that extra time to go and invest in going even further. That's great. Now let's talk about how you can leverage the architecture because there are some concerns, Michael, such as too many eggs in one basket. It used to be that if I had a server failed, one application went down. What if I have a server that fails now and 
uh, 10 applications go down. It seems like it's a, it could be a lot of eggs in one basket. Not the case with Microsoft, but there are some concerns about licensing on top of base software, which we've already addressed here. And ease of integration, I think that we can go ahead and skip, but then performance and scalability over time. Let's talk about how you can address with the lots of eggs in one basket. As long as you have more than one host, you can and should configure failover so that you can protect yourself from that particular case, correct? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, in the 2000R2 mode, a failover is definitely going to remove that sort of one egg in one basket. I mean, you're talking redundancy. As long as you're building redundancy at the hardware level and the networking level and then you build it at the software level, then you're, you're covered for most of your unplanned different times. Yeah, I, I like that cluster validation tool that's built right in because it does make it a lot easier to integrate. For folks who saw my picture up there at front, I've definitely lost a little bit of hair in the earliest of days trying to get clustering going back with parallel Y SCSI cables, <laughs> which was a lot harder back in the day. Nowadays with iSCSI, it, it is a whole lot easier. Uh, in terms of performance and scalability over time, what are your normal rule of thumb recommendations for the number of applications? I know every application varies, so the answer is always it depends. But from a small business perspective, let's say 100 to 250 employees, the basic garden variety set of uh, Microsoft servers that they would have for a company that size. Are you seeing consolidation ratios of 2 to 1, 4 to 1, 7 to 1, 10 to 1? Uh, folks are always asking that question. What, what type of a consolidation can they get of physical Windows servers to uh, VMs? We're seeing about uh, the average ratio in a medium business is about 8 to 1. So, you know, it's definitely removing a lot of your physical servers out there. Um, you know, most, most medium businesses are, are supporting between somewhere between five and eight virtual machines per host. Mm -hmm. um, some organizations are more, some are less, but uh, definitely, the, the, you know, the, definitely the eight to 10 to one uh, consolidation ratio is definitely not out of the question. And with that, it's then uh, feasible that a smaller organization could run their entire operation off of a pair of servers that operate you know, redundantly for each other, enabling you to do migrations, balancing, and protect you from that more than uh, the eggs in one basket. But you could get it down to two fairly good-sized servers supporting the entire operation. Do you see that as being common, or do people deploy three or four just to reduce the number of uh, uh, chances that they have a single point of failure? Well, again, it comes down to the options for um, budget. If they can, you know, afford more afford more nodes in their server clusters, um, then, you, then many organisations do that just from a performance point of view. But definitely, I mean, you know, you can support up to these 512 virtual machines per uh, host in Windows Server 2008 R2. So there's yeah. a lot of uh, capability there. But uh, you know, many organisations that might have between, you know, looking at consolidating 10 to 15 virtual uh, 10 to 15 uh, servers uh, are quite comfortably go down to a, a two-host um, cluster for, uh, for their high availability and their support. Fantastic. And uh, naturally, once you have a good architecture, you want to have a data protection strategy for that environment as well. And I have a slide uh, on some other products from Microsoft that work well in that regard. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, you know, scalability-wise, you can put 255 volumes on a Drobo, each of them 16 terabytes in size. It's the theoretical limit. More practically, you'd probably have a smaller number of volumes for each of your VMs and your applications, and uh, you can scale quite nicely there uh, with the Drobo storage, especially it being consolidated in a shared storage pool. Uh, let's uh, talk about live migration real quick. You talked about the idea between the disruption or having downtime versus zero disruption to the client connections. It, it, uh, maybe a double click down of what you described before. Tell us how it goes about doing that and what the net effect is on the clients as they're continuing to access the applications. Yeah, sure. Because both nodes have access to the shared storage, then that's fine. So they both nodes will understand the pointers of the shared storage. Basically, what happens in a live migration point of view is a template is created on the destination node, which matches the existing one. Your processor and memory um, are, are, based, are copied across from one node to another using fast networking, and then the migration happens, your NIC changes are updated, and you're pointed back to the storage. And that happens within anywhere between 5 and 15 to 30 seconds um, from a live migration point of view. But at, during that time, from a memory point of view, you're doing mirroring of your of your memory and processor architecture uh, uh, and read-write. So effectively, there are zero downtime during that, um, during that live migration. 
Fantastic. And in terms of HA, uh, saving time is huge. I don't know about you, Michael, but uh, since coming here from Australia, do you have more or less time in your day? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess less, right? <laughs> no, I, no I, I, I was recently uh, down under, and uh, yes, it's, it's just as uh, Western and modern and fast-paced. But uh, time really is the thing that really I think most people find most scarce. You, you have to argue that the reason why people are running Hyper-V is because there's an abundance of CPU and memory. If there wasn't such an abundance, you wouldn't be able to consolidate 8 to 1, 10 to 1 uh, on a server. But in this case, really, it's no longer the CPU and memory that are your scarcity. Time really is your scarcity. So being able to load balance applications, test things, even in a small environment, really provides a lot of benefit. And um, and you, you probably hear the same thing. Even the smaller organization, probably even more so because they're wearing multiple hats. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I think time is their greatest commodity. So anything you can... Return time, um, you know, it saves money, saves hair. Um, <laughs> saves exactly. Everything. All right, for the follicly challenged of us, yes, we we, we got to keep what we have. All right, data protection manager. I'm not sure uh, how closely you work with that team, Michael, but uh, it is a application that supports uh, shared disk clusters, file servers, all the different Microsoft applications, both in a non-shared clusters and as well as shared in terms of the exchange stuff. In, in 30 seconds or less, how would you describe DPM to someone who might be considering using that as their data protection strategy? Oh, for sure. So DPM really provides you that next level of protection for all your data across your organization. So from a cluster point of view, it provides me the ability to do um, instant recovery and backup of those clusters if that entire cluster goes down, I can actually uh, you know, move from cluster to cluster. also provides me uh, the great ability to start load balancing my storage across my uh, organization as well. So it gives me that automated capability that if I'm loading up a storage array in my organization, I can start sharing, migrating that storage off um, and providing that sort of, again, layer of orchestration on top of my environment. Yeah, what I like about it is if uh, even though you might migrate something, all the backup migrates with it. So you don't have to change the way you're doing your backup. I think that part of the integration is really helpful. Uh, like anything scripting or anything backup, anytime you have a change, you have to go change everything. And I think that part of it I thought is really cool. Do you get the same feedback? Oh, absolutely. I think DPM is one of our best products in the systems our team. Fantastic. So if you're going to put it all together, folks, if you want to do an SMB virtualization solution, we've talked about Hyper-V. Uh, there's a Hyper-V Server 2008 R2, which is a free download, or uh, you can have it built in to your Server 2008 R2 if you've got it. That is Server 2008 R2. You already have Hyper-V, so uh, you can, and we'd recommend should start using it if you want to take advantage of things like live migration, which are built in. You will need a, a couple of host machines because you want to do high availability. You'd have to have the Hyper-V role installed on each of those nodes. And generally speaking, do people pay someone to help them do this, uh, Michael, or do they leverage resources available you know, uh, on your website and other places in order to kind of do it themselves and get this set up? You know, it depends on um, the size of organization and, the, and, the, and your in-house IT skill. I mean, this is not rocket science, but it's, you know, it's not like installing Word. So, um, you know, if you've got some understanding of Windows IT administration, you could actually, uh, you could actually do this yourself. But um, generally, partners, are, you know, I, I, they do this for a living and uh, they can come in at a really reasonable cost and, and ensure that it's all set up, ensure it's all working, provide you all the capability you require. Great. Now, Drobo is sold through a large uh, number of Microsoft Gold partners who would offer those sort of services. But uh, for folks who want to do it themselves, the wizard-driven type operations do make it easy enough to install. And on the Drobo side, uh, we are known as the easiest to use storage on the planet. So uh, whether or not you choose one of our 12 base systems, which would be more suitable for primary storage, or if you just want to do backups of what you already have out there in, a, in, in your sort of virtualization environment, uh, a smaller uh, iSCSI Drobo might not be suitable for primary storage, but great for storing those backups. So uh, architecturally, you can uh, put one of these solutions together at a relatively low cost, probably lower than you might have thought. So if you're interested in things like live migration, it's something you should take a look at. Now, I want to hit you with just a couple of rapid-fire questions here, Michael, before we wrap up. We already hit that. How many VMs can you consolidate onto one Microsoft Hyper-V host? It depends, but 8 to 10 uh, is not uncommon, so that's a cool answer there. How should the local drive in the Hyper-V host be used? So because people think of shared storage, do they put everything out there, or do they boot off the local drive and then have all the data out on the, the SAN? 
how do you normally go about consulting for smaller organizations who probably aren't booting off a of SAN and they have a local drive in their Hyper-V host? Yeah, absolutely. You know, keep, you can keep the OS on the local drive, um, and then all yeah, uh, just use your shared storage for your virtual machine infrastructure. That works incredibly well. It's a really and a really simple way to duplicate and replicate your your uh, host machines across your environment if you grow. Great. Well, another question: Can I mix physical and virtual servers in the same SAN? You talked about being able to manage both of those side by side. Uh, I can say that uh, from an iSCSI SAN perspective, you can create a bunch of independent volumes. Physical servers could have clustering. You could have a physical server cluster, but more likely in a small organization, you might keep a, a couple of your smaller applications or applications you can't virtualize. You keep them on the standalone hardware the way you have and uh, have those leveraging the same shared storage device. You can create as many uh, shared volumes as you want, and they all show up on your Microsoft server like they're a locally connected drive. So your experience with iSCSI, uh, dial, dial it back 10 years, Michael, it didn't work quite as well. Windows uh, 2000, well, it wasn't quite as good. But since 2003, and especially in the 2008 family and forward, it really is a built-in part of the operating system and really works seamlessly, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's seen, absolutely seamless, as you said. Great. Well, hey, the key takeaways, folks, shared storage is required if you want to take full advantage of server virtualization. There are iSCSI SAN solutions that exist at an affordable cost, Drobo being one of them, but lots of them out there. So if you haven't thought of being able to do high availability, you can uh, and should take a look at that. And if you are uh, already own Windows Server 2009 R2, congratulations. You already have Hyper-V, and you can start taking advantage of these high availability benefits if you build out the architecture. And the purpose of today's discussion was to provide a little bit more information in that regard. Uh, as I go to the last slide, I'll give you some information on a how-to guide and some other assets that Drobo provides to make it even easier for you to go on this step of your journey to the cloud. And uh, do you guys use that word a lot over there, Michael, in your group, the cloud? Certainly the Azure guys and other folks use it. But what does cloud mean to the folks on the Hyper-V team? Oh, well, it's all about private cloud for us, right? And, and Hyper-V is one of the core foundations to the private cloud. And, you know, and, and you know, to sum the private cloud up, it, it just provides you that fully automated and orchestrated way to create a sort of dynamic and flexible infrastructure to support your application. Know, where you move from uh, building an IT infrastructure for an application to an application requesting IT infrastructure that, that is automatically built for it. So it's a very exciting technology, and, and the great thing about it is it, it's the aspects of all of the pr our private cloud technology are, are you know, built into the core foundations of our product. So you don't have to have a private cloud to use private cloud technology, virtualization, automation, orchestration, high availability, all these things are the basis. You know, these, these are what we call cloud-optimized infrastructure, and medium businesses will be using these you know, every day, all day. And that first step toward your journey could be uh, going from a small handful of servers, consolidating those down to a pair of uh, Server 2008 R2 systems, and using Hyper-V and getting some uh, great high availability out of that. Uh, absolutely. That is definitely the first step. As soon as you've virtualized your infrastructure, you've automatically built a, a great amount of flexibility in the way that you then can you know, start standardizing your IT. Fantastic. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Michael, for joining us on today's program, and thanks everybody out there for your participation. You can get some additional information, including that detailed how-to guide I talked about at our website at drobo.com slash Hyper-V. And if folks want to get a hold of uh, your team over there, Michael, at Microsoft, you guys have a blog, which has some pretty cool stuff out there, as well as Twitter. Uh, which one would you recommend in terms of folks wanting to learn a little bit more about best practices for small organizations around uh, Hyper-V? Yeah, the virtualization blog. So if you just go to our TechNet site and search for virtualization blog. And I got the URL right here for you, blogs.technet.com slash b slash virtualization. So folks can there go there and go, get some really cool stuff. That is the best place to do it, for sure. Fantastic. All right, hey, thanks again, Michael. I appreciate you joining today's program. Thank you. All right, that, that's it for this uh, edition, folks. Thanks for joining, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next Drobo Broadcast Network episode, talking more storage solutions and uh, data protection and high availability in small organizations. Thanks. See you next time.